The yoga teachings don't have to be esoteric. It's true that the goal of practice, as per the Yoga Sutras, is ultimately transcending material reality. But how many of us really want to do that? What's great about these teachings is that while they do lead you, or they could, can lead you to these ultimate soteriological spiritual goals, they also help us deal with the problems and the challenges of everyday life. I wanted to make this video about the kleshas to kind of fill out the information and back up the, the last week's video that we had about suffering and how to be happy. And if, it, if there isn't a universal human goal and desire, then isn't being happy ultimately that? As we talked about last week, we humans tend to shoot ourselves in the foot. We hold on to our suffering and we self-sabotage even when we don't mean to, with unconscious habits and behaviours. So when it's unconscious, it's helpful to have a framework through which to see ourselves, to see our behaviours, our patterns, and our most deeply established and hence unconscious habits. So we have a great framework that we find in chapter two of the Yoga Sutras, which is called the Kleshas. These are five kind of tendencies that uh, embodied humans have. Klesha, we can translate it as hindrance or obstacle, basically means anything that is gonna hold you back. We also see this word appearing uh, in an adjectival form in chapter one, where I'm sure you've heard this very famous verse uh, from Patanjali, even if you haven't read the whole Yoga Sutras, Yoga Chittavarti Nirodaha, Yoga is the stilling of the fluctuations of the mind. Patanjali tells us straight away that these fluctuations of the mind, they're not all bad. Some of them are harmful or detrimental, and some of them are not harmful. Klishta, Aklishta. So the kleshas are the things which are detrimental, harmful. They're, they hold us back from ultimately achieving samadhi, which is like that perfect meditative absorption where you become one with the object of meditation. Also, they hold us back in life and they make things harder than they need to be. So let's find out about these kleshas, what they are and how we might be able to deal with them. So the kleshas, we have five of them. They are avidya, ignorance, asmita, ego, raga and vesha, attachment and aversion, and uh, abhinivesha, which is the attachment to life, clinging. So I'd like to unpack all of these uh, a little bit because, you know, these words like ignorance and ego, they're so broad that sometimes uh, you can't even see into what that really means. Uh, also, these translations are sometimes a little bit awkward in that uh, they have some baggage in the Western context, which maybe is not appropriate to the uh, Indian tradition. Let's start with avidya. A avidya, which is usually translated as ignorance. And I don't really like this word because avidya isn't not knowing. It's mistakenly thinking that you do know. Being certain about something when it's not really possible to be certain about it. Patanjali defines avidya as regarding the permanent as impermanent, the impure as pure, the painful as pleasant, and the non-self as the self. So we could unpack some of this. I mean, the most common uh, understanding of avidya is believing yourself to be separate, a separate entity from you know, the interconnectedness of like the spiritual oneness of life, um, which I find to be like quite unfathomable, honestly. Um, so I like to think of it as this, as not seeing clearly um, and having a mistaken understanding about the world. So believing that, this body is you, or jumping to conclusions, being sure about something when it's really not possible. The example I always love is like when you get into a text message argument with someone and then they don't reply and then your mind just like creates all of these situations where you're like, oh my God, they hate me because they didn't text me and I'm never, they're never going to talk to me again and actually their phone just died. So that seems like a very trivial example, but it is a perfect example of avidya because it's you projecting a certainty about a situation, a permanence onto it, which is, is not actually appropriate. 
um, as in the same way, believing that the painful is pleasant, eating like uh, as always, I talk about chocolate cake. We consider that chocolate cake is a is a pleasant and uh, delightful experience, but um, as the Yoga Sutras point out, all sense experiences like that are ultimately not satisfying because they just end up creating more craving. We talked about this a lot in the Karma video. So avidya, it kind of ultimately is all about being overly attached to the material world, which is just going to change and fluctuate. And if you pin your happiness on that, it's just going to make you miserable. So it's helpful just to recognize that we cannot see the world clearly because we only have five senses and they are limited. We have blind spots that are created by our habitual patterns. And so basically, I find it helpful to just start by thinking and understanding that you don't know the full picture, being okay with not knowing. So what about the other four kleshas? Well, Patanjali points out that the other four of them spring out from avidya, from ignorance, when you're overly attached to the material world or you believe the material world to be the be-all and end-all, then it leads to these other four. Beginning with asmita. Asmita is one of two words that we find in the Yoga Sutras, which is often translated as ego. And both of them, I actually think, are kind of broader than how we, in the West at least, understand this word ego, or different, right? So the first word we come across before in the mind video, ahankara, the I maker, like the individu individuation principle. And asmita, it comes from the first person singular of the verb to be, asmi, I am. So asmita is I amness. And uh, I like to think of it as a false identification with the ego, or rather a false identification with an idea of yourself and like the stories about yourself, of how you conceive of what your identity is, an obsession with I, me, mine. So um, it's kind of like <laughs> whenever I'm doing a complicated posture, my teacher uh, tells me, and I start to be like, Oh, well, you know, my back this and I'm carrying my daughter that, my neck. But she's like, don't tell me the stories. Just be here, be with your body and just do it. And I'm like, yeah, like I've understood over time that that's a much more productive approach because these stories rein you in. If you believe that I can't do this because, then you won't be able to do it. If you have an idea of I'm not the kind of person who could do this, then you won't be. Also, if you're arrogant and blow up your story of yourself and your idea of yourself out of proportion, you will have um, an inaccurate idea about how things actually are going to go for you in the world. Um, in reality, our identity is always growing and shifting. And in order to make space for our life and who we would want to become and what we want to be, often we have to let go a little bit of what we thought we were. Patanjali also def uh, defines asmita as conflating the seer, so your power of perception, with your perceptive abilities. Again, this is limiting because if you only identify yourself with your senses, then you're only going to get like a limited view of the world because the senses are, are limited. So it's helpful to understand that it's possible to go beyond what you think of yourself. It's possible to go beyond your idea of yourself. Asmita leads us directly into raga and dvesha, attachment to pleasure and aversion from pain. After, if you try to define yourself after you've gone through the roles that you are, you know, yoga teacher, mother, friend, then after that you might say, well, who are you then? And you'd be like, mm, well, I like this, 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 and I don't like this, this, this. And it, you consider that to be your defining characteristics. But I'm here to point out that these raga and vesha actually can be quite limiting and uh, our likes and dislikes are limiting. When we move around the world and categorize things into, I like that, I don't like that, I like that person, I don't like that person, uh, I believe what he's saying, but I don't believe what she's saying. It means that we don't actually see things for what they really are. Um, if you haven't had an experience, of a positive experience in the past, 
then you're ultimately going to want more of that experience and you will be biased towards it. If you have a negative experience, then you will want less of it. You will want to avoid repeating that experience. And so you'll be biased against it. This is where prejudices come from. And as we know, of course, they don't just exist within one human life. They're passed on in a hereditary way. You know, that's where you get like uh, ancestral racism and cultural racism from and also uh, other cultural prejudices and biases. You can see that you know, entire, uh, the world gets split into this is good and this is bad, which it just isn't really like that. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Shakespeare's Hamlet. There's nothing either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. All of the definitions of this is a good thing and that is a bad thing is just stuff that we project on. There's no inherent and innate quality of goodness or badness on anything. Everything is relative. And so it means that when we actually are blinded by our likes and dislikes, we split the world in half. But the world is always changing. And it means that we don't see things as they really are. And that means that we can act unskillfully. We can act in a way that's not appropriate to what's really happening in the situation. So finally, we come to apinivesha, which is clinging to life or fear of death. And that sounds morbid. Um, and it is, but only because we actually are clinging to life. And of course we are, you know, we want to survive. But Patanjali says that this uh, quality is innate in all humans, even the wise, uh, you know, suffer from abhinivesha. And it's because it's a survival mechanism, you know, the urge of the body to continue breathing. And I believe that all of the kleshas are actually survival mechanisms that are kind of uh, an inherent part of being embodied in a human form. You know, uh, asmita, we need to know who we are in order to cut a line through the world. Raga dvesha, it used to be we would walk through the forest and you go, okay, that berry, if I eat it, I will live. And if I eat that berry, I won't live. You know, you get aversion from the stuff which is dangerous and you are attracted to the stuff which is uh, going to be conducive to further survival. And so apinivesha is our innate resistance to change, trying to stay in our comfort zone trying to, to stay where we know that it's safe. But is a human life defined by staying safe? Once we can actually, you know, achieve a certain level of survival, we want to go beyond that and to live a full life, full of joy and insight. Um, and perhaps if you're going to follow, you know, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, uh, you know, transcendence of material reality and enlightenment or in Kaivalya, if that's what you want to go for. So when you cling to what is familiar, it holds you back from going out and discovering what's new and what is exciting and what is transcendental. Um, and, you know, from a day to day, on a day to day basis, this fear of death and by extension, fear of change, it makes us behave unskillfully because we cling to an illusion of a static reality, which just isn't true. So what do we do with these clashes then? It's not all so bad. Now that we have this framework, it actually shines a light on some of our unconscious and habitual behaviors. When you can see that you're telling stories about yourself, it becomes so obvious to you that you, you realize that you could actually go beyond that. Just by shining a light on the fact that we are blinded to what we like and what we don't like broadens our horizons ever so slightly. We don't need to take in the whole entire world. We don't need to know everything or be absolutely perfectly neutral to everything. But just softening a little bit into the boundaries of our, you know, oftentimes and habitually rigid thinking can help us to perceive the world in a much more fluid and a much more open-minded way, just allows us to enjoy the majesty of what the world has to offer and what we can possibly be, our own potential within this world. So I hope that's useful for you in your spiritual uh, goals or even in your everyday practical life. Om Shanti. <laughs>